Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome. A um, few household arrangements before we start our proceedings. If you have one of these, will you turn it off or put it on silent, uh, as I have done? Secondly, the door that you came in is the door that you go out, unless you want to jump, and I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but <clears throat> we're very, very honoured to have um, Dr. Adam Farkas with us here today. Uh, he's the Executive Director of the European Banking Authority, which is a project in making, I think is the best way to describe it, like so many other things. Uh, but he's very kindly given up his time here today, first of all to make a presentation to us, and then to uh, take questions. The presentation, given the sensitive nature of his job, will be uh, on the record, but the subsequent discussion questions and answers will be under European House rules. In other words, you can <clears throat> use the information that you get uh, from the discussion, but you cannot cite where you heard it or who said it. Uh, with that, Adam, you are most welcome. Thank you. Um, I think I stand up. It's, uh, Please, it's better. Um, I have the presentation here. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me. This is not, not the first time I've been uh, invited. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm a regular, but I've, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back with, uh, with really good memories and, 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 and memories of lively um, and interesting discussions. Um, and I remember in, I think, about four or five years ago when I first came, um, it was really about introducing what the EBA was and what we were up to and what we... Um, what we were planning to do and how we are setting ourselves up and how we grow as an organization, a newly, newly founded organization. Today, I think we have passed that, that mark. Uh, we, we, uh, the work of the EBA is, is, is widely known. So what I would like to talk about today at, at the request of the, of, of, of the Institute and, and the organizers is um, how we see the EBA's role in fostering f future convergence in, 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 in Europe. In, in banking regulation and supervisory practices. And of course, um, I, will, I will also talk a little bit about how Brexit comes into, in, 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 into this mandate, which was as much of a surprise uh, to you as it was to, uh, to us when it happened, um, given that we are, we are seated in London. Um, therefore, we had the first-hand experience of waking up on that Friday morning uh, and learning the results of the uh, or the result of the of the referendum and taking the first uh, um, underground to uh, to see other people's reaction as well. So um, I I will talk about these these three topics um, and I will try to focus on the on the current work of the EBA and the future. So in in a sense introducing what you can expect in in the near term from from the EBA in again in in the regulatory, in the rulemaking area, um, sort of completing the single rule book in Europe, then in, in supervisory um, <coughs> convergence or super, the, 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 um, um, the um, putting pressure on the supervisory authorities to, to uh, uh, converge their practices in, in actual implementation. And then I will, uh, I will talk about how Brexit impacts um, all, of, all of these objectives and, and the work of the EBA. Uh, very briefly, and then I will be very happy to um, to to answer uh, uh, to answer any questions you you may have. So let's um, le let's first look at the um, the rulemaking. As we all know, what Europe is doing in banking, in prudential, um, I'm talking about prudential banking regulation, not not about payments or or, or resolution or or other, just pure prudential banking regulation. The, uh, the European Union committed to the global process of the post-crisis reforms and committed to implement the, the Basel um, agreements, which, which um, is, the, is the global standard setting body for, uh, for prudential rules in the context of the, of the post-crisis reform. As you, as you all know, and, and I'm not going to talk about history, but as, as we all know, the last element of the so-called Basel III package, industry calling it Basel IV, sometimes we call it Basel 3.5, but we, we know what we are talking about. It's the last elements of the post-crisis reform um, 
uh, were agreed in, um, in late uh, 2017, and the Basel Committee published the last components of the, of the post-crisis uh, uh, reform package in, in prudential regulation. What it, in, what it involved, uh, what it entailed, or still entails, is the revised standardized approach of credit risk. So it was really focusing on the risk-weighted asset side, on the, um, the um, nominator side. Um, the, re the revised standardized approach, the revised uh, internal model-based approach for credit risk, it also changed fundamentally the op-risk framework, um, and it, 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 it went into um, reforming or revamping the fundamental review of the trading book, so the market risk framework, including uh, the credit value adjustment framework and, and, um, and also the, the, the general counterparty credit risk framework. Also, the GSIP um, surcharge, the GSIP framework, the global systemically important bank um, uh, add-ons uh, have been reviewed and a new, uh, a new framework was, was published. One of the most controversial, all of this, all of this is to be implemented by 2022. There is one other big, which was the last sticking point in the negotiations, and I, I, I remember the, the discussions. The 72.5, of course, is not a scientific um, outcome of this. An output floor is introduced uh, on the risk-weighted assets, but it will be introduced very slowly over a period of five years, uh, and the level of the output floor is 72.5%, which means that the risk weights given by a particular bank by the standardized approach and the IRB approach cannot be uh, too distant uh, from each other. The floor of the IRB is 72.5% uh, of, the, of the standardized outcome. The, uh, it, it is, but, but because it was so difficult to achieve, there was one additional softener put into, into the agreement, which is that e even in this transition period, uh, the jurisdictions will have a discretion um, to contain the amount of capital requirement increase over this period of time. So if, 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 it, if it was too aggressive, they can, uh, they can, they can cap the, uh, the capital increase in this transition period so that to avoid a sudden, um, a sudden increase, a sudden uptick of capital requirements. It's very important, two points I, I want to make about the, the Basel requirements is that the, it's not yet fine, finished, finished, to the full, there is still an outstanding work stream in the market risk area. Um, and if you have any interest, I'm happy to talk uh, about the details of that, which needs to be completed, or the commitment is that it will be completed by the end of this year. And this, this involves the, the finalization of the FRTB and also the, uh, the standardized, standardized approach on counterparty credit risk. Everything which I will say subsequently is conditional on this being finished by the end of the year, because otherwise it will not work. The last point I, I want to make on the, on, the global, on the global reform agenda is that the treatment of sovereign risk in the, in the prudential framework of banks, as you, as you all know, that there is a debate about this in Europe and there is a debate about this in, in the global um, uh, fora, uh, but it's not part of this package. So it is, it is not going to delay the implementation. There is no agreement on this. There is a paper published by Baza. There are political discussions and, and economic discussions in Europe about this. But the, 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 any change of the sovereign uh, treatment is not part of this agenda. If this happens, it will happen sort of subsequently after, uh, after the implementation of this package. Very quickly. Um, the view of the EBA on the need to implement the, the Basel rules. We have a very strong institutional position on, on, on this one, and this has been very, very consistent. We very strongly, uh, we, we are a strong globalist, so we, we are very strongly in favor of having global standards and allowing banks, international banks, to grow cross-border provide cross-border services, reallocate um, savings to, uh, to investments on a global scale or international scale or cross-border scale, but the condition for this is that there are some global, some global minimum standards that all, all banks who are active internationally have to comply with. 
the reason is, um, it, of course, is the lessons, uh, le uh, the, the, the lesson from the from the crisis, be is because these global banks or some of these global banks were ch were serving as a channel of contagion of the of the risks in the in the financial crisis. So to prevent that uh, and to ensure that they are financially stable, these standards need to be applied globally. So we think that uh, Europe. As a, as a large jurisdiction and a large home to uh, significant international banks, should be uh, genuinely committed to implement the, uh, these global standards into the rulebook of, of European banks. And we are very definite on this for the, for the globally systemically important banks, so the, the real, uh, really big ones. But we think that Europe should pay some attention to see if this is true for everybody else as well. Um, and on this one, we have an open mind, and I will talk about what we are planning to do. We have an open mind to investigate whether specific business models or types of institutions could have a, a proportionate application of these global standards uh, in order to uh, to reduce the regulatory burden on, especially some of the on some of the smaller institutions. However, it's important that when I talk about proportionality, I'm not talking about reducing prudential standards or undermining prudential requirements, I'm talking about a proportionate application of global standards, a simple application of global standards to, um, to, to potentially to certain, uh, certain institutions. Now, what... Okay, there should be a slide after this. That's it. So what we are going to do, I, I, I started to grow concerned um, because I didn't, I didn't see it, it jumped. The, uh, what we are going to do in this, in, in this framework, and, and this is definite information, so this is, uh, this is something you can, uh, you can use and, 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 and quote. The commission is, because it has happened, the commission has issued a call for advice to the EBA. It's a large one. We pop, I think we have already published it, but if not, we will publish it imminently. It's a, it's, a, it's a long document. The Commission is asking the EBA to create a large report, or to draft a large report, assessing the impact of this last remaining package of Basel measures to the European banking system. So we, we are going to make a massive study um, to demonstrate how this, 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 this package is impacting the European banking system. Uh, to that effect, we are going to run a data collection exercise and then an, a, a number crunching exercise within the EBA over the next year, more than, more, than, uh, more than a year. The report is to be submitted by end of June next year uh, when, as we all know, there will be a parliamentary recess in the, in the European institutions, so there will be no legislative action in, in, in that point. That's why we have to do this, this work right now, because we want to prepare the commission services so that when the new commission is, is uh, on its feet in, in late 19 or early 20, then a legislative proposal can go straight <coughs> ahead and the implementation can be put into the European, uh, European law. The data collection exercise, it's very important, will involve a larger sample than the Basel sample. The, ba the Basel committee is going to do its own QIS uh, starting from midsummer. We will completely align with this QIS, but extend the sample and extend the data requirements somewhat, but, but minimal, uh, compared to the, uh, the Basel templates. We are thinking about 400 banks in, in Europe to represent different business models and different sizes of these institutions and different geographies in, in, of, of, of these institutions. So, we, of course, when we do sampling, we always talk uh, to the supervisory authorities to actually select the, the banks who will be in the sample. And what we, what we try to do is to measure the impact of this, of this package to all these business models which we, which we have identified. As a point of reference, if you look at the EBA's report on the NSFR, the ICR, the leverage ratio, uh, it, 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 we identified about a dozen business models and we, we measured the impact of these individual measures or individual standards on, on, these, on these different business models. That, that's exactly what we are going to do now. 
um, to, uh, in, in the context of this entire package. So we will, uh, we will try to identify how these different types of institutions from a small cooperative in, um, in, in the Baltic countries uh, to, a, to a relatively small universal bank in Malta, uh, to a medium-sized bank in Ireland, all the way up to the global CIFIs of, of Europe will be measured and, 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 and looked at. So we, that's what we plan to do. The, um, the, um, again, as, as I mentioned, the report is due by June next year, and it will be published in full. We might even try to do limited consultation in, on, along the way if we see something that, that would require engagement with the industry, but we are not, not promising a full-scale, uh, full consultation on the, on, on, on the report. The, um, on the basis of this report, the plan is that the Commission will prepare a legislative proposal in the, in the services, and once the new Commission is out, uh, legislative proposal will follow and that will allow, subject to, of course, the political uh, legislative process, it will allow the implementation to kick in from January 2022, which is the Basel deadline. So, we, so Europe will, uh, will, in this way, will be able to, um, to meet its international obligation on implementing these, these standards. Now, one sensitive political issue here, which will, which will come up, is the how the discretions are exercised in Europe, which are provided in the Basel text. If, if somebody reads the Basel text, there, there are lots of discretions um, to individual jurisdictions who implement these standards um, in, in, in many areas. And I will not want to name uh, individual areas, but there are some significant ones. And, of course, in Europe, the question will arise, should we exercise these discretions at the European level, so one single exercise, or should, should, should the European legislation subdelegate this to national, uh, national level? I don't think um, there is any doubt what my view is on, 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 on this one. Um, so we, we, will, we will make proposals on, 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 uh, on this, but, of course, the, the, a proposal from the EBA is no guarantee for... Uh, for, uh, for success, but we, um, we, this, this, this will be a very interesting point of the, of the, of the legislative discussions when it, when it gets there. Of course, what the EBA is expecting is from, this, uh, from these legislative proposals, um, some technical standards will, um, and guidelines will spin out of, of this, so we will have level two work uh, and level three work stemming from these, uh, from these proposals. But once this is completed, and again, the, the idea is to complete it by sometime by 2020 or, or, or mid-2021, we consider that this will conclude the, the post-crisis uh, wave of prudential reforms that were, that were agreed in the G20 context and followed through in the, in, in the Basel standard setting process and the, uh, the implementation in different jurisdictions. So this will be sort of the conclusion of the, of the main strand of, of, of um, changes in prudential rules. And we are, we are, we are, we are an integral part of this and, and the key player in, 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 in this process. Now, let's assume this is closed and this is, uh, this is happening uh, as planned. What, um, what, I, uh, what else I'd like to, to talk about, and very briefly, is what we do see in the horizon for the future in, in regulatory convergence. What is, what is coming on stream um, these days? One clearly is sustainable finance or green finance. Um, we are all familiar with the, um, with the Commission's um, action plan to introduce sustainable finance into into the European legislative uh, agenda, including introducing it to the, uh, to the prudential framework of, of financial institutions, so insurance, uh, banking, and, and uh, capital markets. Uh, there, is, there is a published action plan of the, of the Commission, and there is, a, there is a clearly defined role for the EBA and for the other ESAs in this, in this action plan. Um, we will be playing a key role in defining the, in, in, in creating or drafting the taxonomy of what, 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 what is a green, uh, what is sustainable, what is a green uh, um, uh, investment. Uh, 
Um, because, of course, to do anything in the Prudential Framework, you need first uh, taxonomy and, and, and definition, so that will be the first step. And then the next one we, will be where we lend our expertise to, the, to this um, overall process in designing products that can be considered as green investments for, for loans or for issuance of bonds or for any, any contracts that are, uh, that are uh, investable by, uh, by insurance companies. So we will, we will try to give prudential advice on, on what, what asset classes can be included in these products and what is the eligibility criteria based on the taxonomy. We will talk about the structural and standardization features of these, of these products. We will talk about disclosure requirements and due diligence requirements that would normally, uh, that would normally um, um, be defined, in a, in, for example, in securitizations um, or covered bonds or, or other similar, uh, mm -hmm. similar structure. So we will, create, we will help creating this taxonomy and investable uh, products, financial products, based on the taxonomy that would support the sustainability of our, um, of our planet uh, by allowing financial institutions to, uh, to invest in these in a regulated way. And then, of course, there will be discussions about the prudential treatment and, and, and other things, but it will come um, at a later stage. So this is something that is in the, in the pipeline. Second one, and I will try to be as short as possible on this because this could, uh, this could take uh, a day is proportionality. Uh, we have, it's, it's very clear that in the, in the European discussions on financial regulation, proportionality is, is becoming uh, more and more um, a central uh, point of focus of the, of the policy discussions uh, because, um, because it's, it's very clear that in the, in the wave following the financial crisis, the implementation of, of the of, of prudential rules was 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 not let's say not considering proportionality as the highest priority, and that um, clearly has some side effects uh, for certain uh, uh, segments of the market um, in in the way of overly complex and and cumbersome um, regulatory requirements, and therefore again I would repeat repeat myself. Um, I, I, we, have to, we have to make efforts, and this clearly will be a priority for us on the way forward, uh, to identify how we could have better regulation in, uh, in terms of applying proportionate requirements without jeopardizing financial stability or undermining the prudential, uh, prudential standards. One area which I, I put on this slide is reporting, which is a clear example. Proportionality in reporting should not mean that banks who are smaller should not report. Uh, that's, the, that's the important uh, thing. Proportionality must be based on maximum harmonization. And, and the, the illustration, I, I, uh, the, 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 the example I, I, I put up here is, is that in 2011 in Europe, and this is unbelievable, in 2011 we did not have a single definition of what CET1 is. So we did not have a single uh, definition in the EU, EU what the, the most, um, the highest quality capital of a bank is. Um, it was not defined uniformly in the, in the EU in 2011. Uh, in 2013, and we all remember the, 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 the discussions on NPLs, we did not have a single definition of what, an, what NPL is in, in the EU. We were talking about NPL ratios and compared countries and banks. Analysts were um, in and out of the, of the market with all sorts of charts and comparisons, but in the EU we did, we did not have a single definition of MPLs. And I could go on and on and on and on. It is, it is really important that first we need to arrive to single definitions uh, and, and, and a consistent definition of aggregates before we can talk about proportionality. Uh, because without, without this maximum harmonization of, of, of definitions and standards, we cannot really genuinely uh, maintain comparability with a proportionate application. So in our, in our view, proportionality needs to be based on maximum harmonization and needs to, be, uh, needs to be driven by the same definitions but with a proportionate application of the, of the, of the, of the requirements based on the, on the same definitions and the same prudential standards. In reporting, we are, we are progressing and trying to uh, to make progress um, to apply this, this principle 
And, and uh, again, if you have questions, I will be happy to go into some of the details. Last uh, topic, because this is uh, m much more wide ranging, I think the EBA will have a lot of, a lot of uh, role in the, um, in the completion of the or the furthering of the financial integration in, in, in Europe, mostly focusing on, on the deepening of the integration in the banking union. We all know the legislative trains that are, that are in, in motion right now, the, C, the CRD5, uh, CRR2 package. This, will, uh, this is in a political discussion now. This will imply work for the, for the EBA. There are discussions on, on EDIS. There are discussions on prudential backstops for, the, uh, uh, for, the, for EDIS and for the resolution fund. Uh, there, is a, there is an action plan in MPL reduction, which is still uh, on the agenda in Europe. Um, and there, is, there, there are discussions within the European context on sovereign expo exposures and how to, how to treat them. These are all future uh, or ongoing um, work streams. Uh, we will have a key role in some of, uh, some of, these, uh, some of these, uh, the, these topics in the, in the rulemaking area. I'm, I'm pretty sure there will be questions relating to, uh, to these specific, um, specific uh, packages um, in after, after I finish my remarks. Now, next topic is, so in, in summarizing the rulemaking, it, it, you, can, you can probably have a feel that despite the fact that one would expect that the rulemaking role uh, somehow plateaus out after a while, after a crisis, um, we are nowhere near to that point. We are expecting still um, a lot, lot to come, but at least the clarity on what is coming is now, is now much better than a, than a few years ago. Next topic is um, supervisory practices. So what do we do uh, to try to ensure that these rules, which are all very nice and, 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 and single, how are they put into, into supervisory practice and how consistency is ensured? To this end, what we try to do is to have a systemic approach on, on, on the work of the EBA on supervisory convergence. And the, the frame of this work is that we issue regularly, we try to do it annually, but we, 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 we don't commit, but we do a, a report on the convergence of supervisory practices in the EU on an annual basis. So we issued one in 15, one in 16, and one in late uh, 17. What sort of tools do we have to, uh, to try to further or foster uh, supervisory uh, convergence, given that we are not direct supervisors, so we are not supervising any single firm in the, in the European Union. We are, uh, our clients or our um, counterparts are the supervisory authorities, so the SSM and the, the, the other national uh, supervisory authorities. First of all, the first tool is, of course, the single rule book, the regulatory tools. I, I, I mentioned those. Second one is training. We are expanding our training offering in, 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 in supervisory um, areas. And the third one is monitoring and assessment, and that is becoming more and more um, important. And in, under monitoring and, and, and assessment, what we try to do is we run peer reviews of the supervisors. We do staff reviews on uh, desk based so we, we just take a topic, um, a, a sort of thematic um, selection of, of, of different topics, and we try to do a staff review after some gathering of information and, and engagement. And we produce uh, reports. Some of them are confidentially fed back to the supervisory authorities. Some of them are distilled and, and then published. Then we monitor supervisory colleges in, uh, in, in Europe, so we attend the, the, the largest supervisory colleges. And we, uh, we also run um, staff reviews, on-site staff reviews of some of the, uh, some of the uh, supervisory practices which we, want to, uh, which we want to look at. In 2017, we issued, uh, we issued a, a report, the, the latest one, and it was focusing on, on the SHREP um, practices, and those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with everyday banking supervision, the SHREP is the pillar two uh, process, the supervisor review and assessment uh, process. So that's how the supervisors decide how much uh, bank-specific idiosyncratic um, 
capital requirements and, and, and guidance um, is to be added to, uh, to the minimum capital requirements of banks. So that, that was the focus. Second one is uh, internal governance, how internal governance is assessed. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to mention the recent cases in uh, AML and, and other related issues where clearly uh, there we are seeing some, uh, some let's say, some, uh, at least we are raising some questions about how um, the, um, the internal governance structure is supervised in, 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 in banks by the different supervisors. Um, the, um, the, um, we did an assessment of recovery plans and we are doing a benchmarking of the model outcomes of internal models. So we compare what banks are coming up with in terms of the assessment of portfolios by their internal models um, to, uh, to come to risk-weighted assets and, 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 and capital requirements. So we compare this and we are, we are providing feedback. Again, all of this is to try to see how consistent supervisors are when they are, they are putting into practice what we what we produce in the rule books in the form of level two or or level three um, guidelines, so this was the focus for seventeen. Um, what we are going to look at um, in the in, in the future, so on on the way forward, it is very clear that the strap is 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 key, um, and and of course in there is one elephant in the room which is the SSM in, in the SHREP process, because the, the SSM is, is now, after Brexit, the SSM will supervise about 90% of banking assets in, 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 in Europe. So there will be one single supervisor who will have a direct or indirect responsibility for, for, the, uh, for, for the largest chunk of, uh, of European banking assets. And therefore, the, the methodology uh, defined in the SHREP guidelines and how it is applied will be, will be critical. And we have to make sure that it is, it is applied in line with what we, what we intended to, uh, to do. Or if, needs, if it needs to be reviewed, then we review it to, together with the, with the supervisors. There, there are questions, uh, or there, let's say there are inconsistencies identified in our report on uh, about how the ICAP, the internal um, risk assessment models of banks, is being used by the, by the supervisors, how they rely or don't rely on this. There is, a, there is a debate about how transparent the supervisor should be with respect to the uh, Pillar 2 requirements and how detailed and granular that transparency should be towards the banks and towards the general public. There are very different views on, on, on this in Europe and different practices in, in, in supervision. Even within the banking union, the, the, there are, um, let's say, um, national cultures uh, still prevailing that are that are different, um, and I'm not trying to say what my personal view is. It's what what, what we see is that the the, the practice is not not uh, consistent, and there is a, another interesting area, which is that some of the authorities are proposing to use pillar two uh, and pillar two requirements for macroprudential purposes. And initially, as we know, pillar two was not designed for macroprudential purposes. But some of the authorities are insisting that it has to be factored in and macroprudential consideration should come into the, uh, the pillar two requirements. So there are, let's say, I identified some topics that are, I would consider them hot topics or, 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 or topics of interest for further uh, review and, 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 and look uh, as to how consistent uh, practices are. We have a pillar two roadmap. Um, when do I have to finish? In 10 minutes, or I'm around? Two or four minutes, okay. The, okay, so we only have Brexit left, so. <laughs> um, so the, the um, so the, the uh, we have a roadmap, and we, we are sort of following this roadmap to, uh, to go through topics um, after topics to, uh, to look at these, uh, the, the, these issues. And the last point I would make is that we are putting more resources uh, on the way forward uh, to training. So we will, uh, we will try to increase, especially online training, which can be, um, which can be um, uh, more effective in reaching more supervisors than, than in-room in, than in training. So last topic for three, and three four minutes, Brexit. Um, the, I have three slides on, on Brexit. One is 
the expected Brexit impact on, on, uh, in the area of banking. Uh, and I, I don't think I will say much of, um, uh, of, of new information in, 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 in here. It is clear that Brexit in, in the area of banking or financial services in a broader sense has a major impact because the, because the UK and London in particular is the largest financial centre in the Europe. This is, uh, this is something of a, of a fact. It is also true, and without prejudice to the political discussions, we don't know where they are going to end up, but without prejudice to the outcome of these political discussions, it is very clear that if, if Brexit goes ahead, the access of UK-based financial service providers in the way of passporting, free passporting, will be curtailed. Um, it will not, not be the same as, as it is today. Again, we don't know exactly what it will be, but it will not be what it is, what it is today, and it will be, uh, it will be curtailed. The, the third point I would like to make, and, and on the EU27 po uh, side, this, this point has been made repeatedly, is that different scenarios are, 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 are possible, and we, of course, we all monitor the political progress, and we all welcome any, any progress that is, uh, that is being achieved. But unfortunately, uh, among the plausible scenarios, there is still one which is the most negative, which is called the cliff edge or the hard Brexit or a no deal or a no deal scenario. And therefore, we have to be prepared for even the worst outcome uh, ourselves, and the industry needs to be prepared for even the worst outcome of the of, of, of the process. And and again, I say this with regret, but this is the this is the the sheer fact. So we are putting out a lot of communication and, and, and engagement uh, with the industry, uh, to, to the industry, uh, to make sure that the private sector is also prepared um, for, the, uh, for the impacts of, of, of Brexit and to the reduction of, of mutual access to, uh, to the markets, because it's not only impacting UK-based institutions, but it's also impacting institutions in the EU27 who use London uh, for, for various um, 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 purposes. And I would mention um, four areas which are critical in this and, and, and disputed or, or let's say um, uh, controversial of how this preparation should take place. One is the area of contract continuity, in, especially in the case of, a, of, of, the, of the worst outcome. The second one is data transfer. The third one is FMI, financial market infrastructure access of, of the firms. And the last one is access to funding markets of, 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 of clients as well as, uh, as financial institutions. So these are, I would say, the key areas of, of preparation that needs to take place um, in, the, in the context of, of, of Brexit. There are, of course, different views as to how much the preparation or the necessary action should rest on the shoulders of the private sector as opposed to the public sector in these, in, in these areas. There are disagreements uh, on, on, on this around, uh, around the discussions, but nobody disputes that these, these topics, these risk issues are, are there and need to be addressed. Brexit impact on the EBA. Again, very briefly, the EBA we have already gone through some changes, some fundamental changes when the banking union was created that we, we had to reposition the EBA uh, significantly. And this will, Brexit will mean another repositioning of the EBA. Because pre-Brexit, the, with the banking union, we had a very strong role to ensure the, this bridging between the ins and the outs. So the Eurozone members and the, or the banking union members and the non-banking union members. Now with the UK leaving, the, the balance will, uh, will, uh, will tilt very strongly towards the banking union. So this bridging function of the EBA, although it will remain because there will be out still, but their, their weight and significance will, will reduce, uh, this bridging function will, will shrink uh, in, the, in, the, in the mission of the EBA. So the other thing which will happen is that the uh, that there will be a shift from the, um, from the uh, rulemaking to ensuring that the rules are consistently applied in supervisory practices. The third one 
um, again, as a consequence of, of Brexit, is that the role of the EBA in supervisory colleges will reduce. So there will be less um, cross-border colleges which would involve other jurisdictions than banking union jurisdictions. So there will be, of course, there will be a few, but the, the number will, uh, will shrink in, 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 terms of, um, in terms of significance. So that, that work of the EBA will also reduce uh, somewhat. <clears throat> There will be one um, important function or, or, or task of the EBA which will increase or expect it to increase, um, and this is equivalence. So we, it's very clear that the role of the EBA in third country assessments and, monit and possibly monitoring um, on a continuous basis will increase. And this is, this is, this is sort of boosted by the, by the Brexit process, again, without prejudice to what exactly the outcome is going to be. And of course, there is one, um, one last point, is that the EBA itself will be relocated from, uh, from London, as we, all, as we all know, but I don't want to talk about uh, of that. It's um, trying to avoid that subject. Um, now, Brexit-related EBA work. Um, what we are doing in the context of Brexit, we do regular risk assessment, um, especially focusing on cliff edge risks, so uh, focusing on the worst case scenario. We, are we have a system of monitoring relocation decisions and restructuring of, of, of banks, and of course Dublin is, is, uh, is, is one of the major centers in, in Europe which is uh, having a lot, of, uh, a lot of action these days. We are providing guidance on outsourcing, which in the context of Brexit became a very hot topic um, um, after sitting on very low in the, in, in the sort of priority lists um, of, of supervisors. We are also providing guidance on back-to-back -back transactions and trying to understand uh, booking models and, and, and how different entities in the financial sector operate and, and what models we can, uh, we can use. We are... Um, we are doing internal preparation within the EBA for future supervisory cooperation, which will uh, eventually will need to be put in place. And we also took some organizational changes within the EBA to reflect uh, these shifting priorities and, 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 um, and uh, different um, changes in, 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 our in our expected changes in our mandate. So we are very active ourselves with respect to uh, Brexit. Not only, not only the industry and other, other supervisors are exit. And this is the last slide, so I will stop here and, and, and open, open for questions. I'm